Uh, let's get started. Um, welcome to our seminar. Uh, my name is uh, Jin Lu, the co-chair of Dashu Journal Club. Uh, we are honored to have Dr. Liu here today. Um, before we get into the presentation, uh, we uh, are going to give you a quick introduction of Dashu. Um, so Dashu is uh, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we have like a tax exam status by federal and by California state. Um, and currently we have many uh, strategic, uh, strategic partners like uh, SFA. Yeah, SFA. Yeah. <laughs> e, oh, sorry, please mute yourself. Uh, uh, and we have a mis uh, uh, strategy partners and so uh, like I have, uh, SFA, SA, um, BA, uh, ES, CABS and so on. Uh, currently we are a very young organization founded about like four years ago. Um, the good news is uh, our membership is free. Um, as long as you attend any of our event, you will be automatically be a member. My uh, our uh, administrative cost is also very low. All of us work as volunteers. So if you are interested in funding us, all the funding goes to to serve the community. Um, the goal of this organization is to um, provide a virtual community for people interested in data scientist, uh, data science, uh, and we can help each other. Uh, in the community and, and we uh, organize um, we organize uh, all kinds of uh, uh, like a science, scientific conference, uh, Mountain General Club, uh, technical seminars and career development events and uh, educational uh, lectures uh, such as the legal series. Uh, we're currently seeking uh, members and volunteers and the new ideas as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so more about the Virtual Journal Club. Uh, currently, we're trying to do it monthly. If you uh, go to our website, you can see a blue Virtual Journal Club logo on there, and you can click on it. You will find all of our um, previous journal clubs, um, the videos and the slides. Uh, we, we share those uh, uh, slides and uh, uh, videos if the uh, speakers give us the permission to do that. Uh, currently, we have more than um, 10 general clubs on the uh, website. So for the general club, we need your help in many ways. Uh, if you are interested in hearing a particular topics, uh, you can let us know. Uh, if you are working on some uh, specific uh, data science topic and want to share, us, share with us, uh, you can let us know. Uh, if uh, you like our journal club and uh, you can help us to spread the word and uh, broadcasting our event. Yeah, that's how you can help. Uh, next night. Uh, so in the coming uh, May, we will have um, a speaker um, called uh, Professor Hong Kai Ji uh, uh, to talk about the global prediction of Beijing uh, regulatory landscape uh, using bug and the single cell RNA seq. So um, the talk is about um, the, a new tool that uh, he developed um, to integrate the ATAC seq uh, with uh, the prediction from the RNA seq um, to increase the power uh, and the value for both method. Next slide, please. And today I'm very honored to uh, introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Liu. Um, uh, and uh, the topic is about uh, uh, complex and innovative trial design for real disease uh, on the analysis of single arm trial uh, with uh, natural history control. Um, Dr. Liu is an ASA fellow uh, and also is the founder of the quantitative regulatory medical science. LS, LLC. So uh, after uh, leading this uh, uh, strategic and uh, technical innovation at uh, uh, Medicus Therapeutics um, with successful FDA approval of uh, Megala State uh, for fibroid disease uh, and granting a um, breakthrough uh, therapies designing 
uh, 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 therapies and designation for uh, ATGAA in pump disease. Uh, Qing is uh, um, back to the consulting at uh, QR Medsize LLC uh, to make his uh, uh, expertise ac accessible to other companies. And Qing has uh, extensive publication in statistical research for innovative clinical trial design and uh, uh, in the medical research uh, so through a uh, um, broad collab uh, co collaborative research with statisticians and, uh, uh, and in uh, academics like uh, uh, NIH uh, and also on top, top tier pharmaceutical companies. Um, so um, um, please join me uh, in uh, welcoming Dr. Liu for his uh, wonderful talk. Uh, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I yes. can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, let me actually switch uh, to my talk. So, uh, uh, as I introduced, uh, this talk uh, is on virtual match control analysis to compare a single arm trial with a natural history control. And uh, in fact, this is actually a second talk in a non-technical seminar series, series I'm preparing now. And the first one is a regulatory trial design and application overview. So the second one is the uh, uh, you know, virtual match control analysis for comparing a single arm trial with the uh, natural history control. And also uh, following uh, this talk, there will be uh, at least five technical um, presentations. So, I mean, get into actual specific uh, methodology, formulas, and uh, you know, simulation result charts and numbers. Uh, and it's, uh, it's actually organized by uh, the first three are uh, based on the endpoint. First one is continuous endpoint. The second is the ordinal categorical endpoint. And the third one is the time to event endpoint. And then uh, the other specific talk is uh, we we'll talk about you know the development of SAP uh, using a process called adaptive statistical analysis planning, and then last one is actually on um, um, platform trial for cost efficient utilization of natural history studies. So today's one is actually the general talk, non technical, and uh, I guarantee I don't even have a single formula for that. The the outline starts with. Uh, um, legal foundation and a regulatory pathway. And then followed by uh, a general framework. Now I'm going to talk about virtual match control methodology. And uh, the next section is, uh, I'm going to talk about blinding and the SAP development. Uh, and then followed by applications. And, and then at the end, uh, have some discussion topics. Um, part one, uh, it's on legal foundation and regulatory pathway. And uh, I shall start with uh, looking at substantial evidence and then followed by you know, complex innovative designs, real world evidence, amendment to Orphan Drug Act, and the FDA gene therapy guidance for rare diseases, and then uh, SHE10 on natural history control. So uh, one of the important aspects in uh, uh, in the U.S. is that uh, there's this thing called the Food Drug Cosmetic Act. And this is a law that, that, that governs, you know, how uh, to conduct clinical trials and the standards by which a drug can be uh, approved. It, uh, it requires a substantial evidence, and which means uh, evidence consisting of uh, adequate and well-controlled uh, investigations including uh, clinical investigations by experts qualified by scientific training and experience to evaluate the effectiveness of the drugs involved on the basis of which could be clearly and responsibly be conducted by such expert that the drug will have the effect it purports or is represented to have under the conditions of use prescribed, recommended, or suggested in the labeling or proposed labeling thereof. And then uh, the, 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 this, uh, this actually, the, you know, this actually uh, criteria, substantial evidence, does not really distinguish whether it's a, uh, it's a common drug or rare disease. 
And uh, however, uh, the 21st Century Cures Act requires the FDA to issue guidance on the use of a complex adaptive and other novel trial design to satisfy uh, the substantial uh, evidence uh, standard. So meaning that you don't have to actually use the same old uh, uh, trial design and the statistical analysis, so you can actually came, uh, come up with something novel and, uh, and uh, but you know, it's adaptive, complex, you know, uh, you can actually use, uh, use such, um, you know, this kind of design and methodology to satisfy the substantial uh, evidence standard. Now, uh, regarding real world evidence, this is actually a, a real big deal. And, uh, you know, the Cures Act says actually you can actually use the real world evidence uh, to help support approval of a new indication of a drug approved, already approved. And an example of this is actually, you know, Pfizer just get their um, a breast cancer, a drug appro uh, approved for breast cancer in men. And two is support satisfy post approval study requirement, meaning that if you have a seller approval, and then in order to, to do a post approval trial, you don't even have to actually do, you know, a randomized trial. You can actually use the real world evidence, you know, do a single arm trial and against a natural history study. Now, uh, the, the term real world evidence is defined by the Congress, but by the law is that uh, data regarding the usage or the potential benefit and risk of a drug derived from sources other than randomized clinical trials. So the definition is extremely clear. As long as you have the data from other places, other than you know, studies, other than randomized clinical trials, it qualifies as, as real world evidence. Now, uh, it, it actually says uh, specifically, uh, the source of real world evidence, including you know, observational study and the registry and also other things, but I'm interested in observational studies and registry. And also the law granted the FDA substantial flexibility. You know, it says actually, you know, you can use real world evidence for, for things, you know, as long as you, you think uh, it's a sufficient basis for, there is a sufficient basis for using that. You, it doesn't really have to, you know, uh, to be specified in this section. This section meaning this section of the law. Now, in response to the to, to, the, to the law, FDA issued a framework of uh, real-world evidence program, and uh, you know it pretty much uh, you know covers all the categories of uh, of uh, approval, you know, uh, 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 including the new drug already approved, post-approval study requirement, and also biological product uh, license under the Public Health Service Act. Now, uh, the other thing is that uh, you know the law requires FDA to give up approval under certain consider, uh, considered conditions. And the FDA says, well, actually we are already using RWE to support drug approval uh, for oncology and rare diseases. When it is not possible to do randomized trial, and then you end up with actually using single arm trial and compared with uh, natural history study. I mean, RWE of natural history study that comes from uh, retrospective chart reviews. And, uh, and also, uh, well, as far as actually, you know, well, well how you use real-world evidence from a, run, a retrospect study, FDA, I mean, there's this paper, JAMA paper by Woodcock. It pretty much says, well, there's a lot of issues you have to worry about, for example, systematic bias and missing data. And it's a particular problem with retrospective studies in which less will characterize patient limit adjustment for confounders. So, you know, there's a limit here. You can use it but there is a limitation. And then uh, there is a new FDA draft guidance on natural history studies for rare disease. It points out there's eight limitations uh, for retrospective natural history studies. And uh, there's eight of them, a lot of very detailed. I'm not able to actually uh, to put it everything on a single slide. So I, I categorize uh, uh, in, in the following categories. I mean, one is actually data completeness, the other is comparability. And then another important aspect is that, you know, whether the trial is contemporaneous, meaning whether it's, whether it's really too old. And then there's a lot of concerns about selection bias, it's the timeline bias, meaning if you have a, a study, it started with 100 patients, you end up with 30 or 40, uh, you know, 30 or 20 patients, I mean, using that 20 patients is really problematic. And then there's also publication, publication bias, which we, we all know. 
And if you actually rely on literature to find natural history controls, I mean, you have to be aware of those published are, pos are possibly, you know, have a positive result. And then, you know, uh, there's also en enrollment criterion bias. I mean, how do you actually design natural history set versus the enrollment criteria? Those are, are problematic areas. And, uh, and then, uh, but however, the draft guidance says, well, you know, uh, it, it can be actually really useful. It says external natural history control is most interpretable when treatment effect is large in comparison to potential biases. You know, it, it doesn't really, really say, you know, you cannot have a bias, it recognizes the bias and eight of them. And then it says, well, uh, as long as the treatment effect size is large enough, it is larger in comparison to all the, you know, potential bias combined, and then, you know, uh, you know, it, it is interpretable. So, uh, on the one hand, there's a lot of problems. On the other hand, it, it lay out the criteria. This is really a critical criteria, but it, it, to see whether, you know, a uh, natural history study uh, produced enough, you know, real world evidence. Now, uh, uh, there's a, another aspect of the Cures Act. It actually make, uh, made amendment to the Orphan Drug Act. It now says actually, you know, sponsors or, or organizations can actually get uh, funding from the FDA to prospectively plan uh, observational studies and also uh, specify uh, 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 other analysis. I mean, this actually pretty much says, you know, in order to do natural history study, you have to be prospective design, and also uh, the statistical analysis has to be, you know, pre-specified. And then, uh, and then uh, last year, last Ju uh, July, uh, the FDA uh, CBER issued uh, gene therapy guidance. It include, you know, uh, 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 three basic designs. One is actually, you know, well-known randomized parallel group design. And the other is a single arm trial with natural history controls from initial observation. So meaning you can start at, with a perspective of observational studies. At a certain point, you can start randomized patients to, uh, you know, to the treatment or continue on the control. And then the, the third category is a single arm trial with external natural history studies, natural history controls. And, and then uh, I'm actually interested in this talk, focus on ex single arm trial with external natural history control. Now, uh, SHE10, you know, developed actually 20 years ago. It actually has a, a whole lot of more on, on the issues regarding uh, um, natural history control. It says actually you need to pre-specify pre statistical analysis, you know, to reduce selection by selection of control groups to be made before performing comparative analysis. And this may not always be visible as outcome from uh, these control groups uh, may have been published. So this is really interesting. It says, well, you, you have to do the, you know, pre-specify everything, but then, you know, it's not feasible. And then the issue is in practice, how do you resolve this problem? And, uh, and uh, it actually specified there are two methods of uh, statistical analysis. One is actually based on matching on selection criteria, meaning that, you know, natural history study, you've got lots of patients with different risk factors, and you've got single arm trial, with certain characteristics. And, and then one methodology is sort of you, you, you actually look at actually the selection, uh, the enrollment criteria of your, natural, uh, of your single arm trial, and then use that to define the, uh, the selection, patient selection criteria uh, from the natural history control. So that's actually one methodology. And it is OK if you have a large natural history study, lots of patients, thousands of patients, you can certainly afford to do that. But then, uh, you know, there, there's another different uh, methodology, is you, meaning you can make an adjustment to account for population differences, meaning that uh, you have a natural history study which doesn't have exact the same, you know, uh, patient uh, uh, characteristic as the single arm trial. And then instead of actually using the, you know, selection criteria to subset the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the patients of the natural history study, and you can actually use a model, and, and then you know, you know, to, to make some adjustments. So there's really two different methodologies for uh, for statistical analysis. And then uh, the the other aspect is that uh, well, sometimes uh, it's just really hard to rely on single natural history uh, study to really make a determination of comparative effectiveness for the purpose of uh, 
you know, a drawing statistical inference. And in this situation, you actually use a, use a multiple multiple historical control. And then, so now, uh, let me actually switch to uh, a part two general framework. And uh, the objective is really uh, very similar to any other settings. Simply, we want to establish comparative effectiveness of a treatment versus a control. So you have a treatment, you have a control, but then the disease uh, in question is just oncology and rare diseases. I mean, this is actually based on FDA's, uh, you know, uh, framework. It says, you know, we're already doing that, so let's actually co continue to talk about this. And then the clinical program is really simple. You know, you got a single arm trial and then study a new drug, and then you have an external natural history study of real world evidence. And then, you know, in order to meet the criteria of um, multiple natural history study, you can actually digitize data, you know, uh, from, uh, from different studies that publish in the literature. So this is actually pretty much the bulk of the clinical program. And then, uh, so the criteria for external natural history studies, you know, has to be pros prospectively planned and designed. And then you have to have a broad patient population to allow subsetting. And then also have to have a statistical analysis plan. And then uh, one important aspect is that one could actually start the retrospective study and then it would be nice to, you know, if it's possible to prospectively follow those patients, if those patients, you know, still in the system. And this actually will resolve the issue of uh, contemporaneousness. Now, uh, regarding actually the statistical method, you know, uh, that I'm uh, we, uh, I'll be presenting would be pretty much uh, uh, two aspects. One is called a virtual match control analysis, and it utilizes one-to-many matching with, a, with a prediction models. So, so you, you see here, for rare disease, I'm not actually using, you know, uh, a, a selection criteria to further subset, you know, already very small natural history study. So I'm going to use the one to using models to do one to many matching. And then I develop an efficient intergroup analysis. And a part of that is actually tipping point analysis, just to actually look at actually, you know, uh, how large the treatment effect should be in comparison to all the biases. I mean, as far as I know, this is the only methodology developed to really meet the, the criteria of the new guidance document, which was only published in March, uh, March 1st, but then actually we started uh, developing the methodology two years earlier. And, uh, and then the other important aspect is, uh, you know, blinding and the AS, uh, blinding of the natural history data and uh, talk about, you know, how to, if you blind it, and there is a lot of problem with the data, missingness, and how do you actually develop the SAP in a blended way? And I'm going to talk, uh, a uh, little bit more about it. So it start with metadata report, just look at the, you know, what you have, what you don't have, but not looking at the data itself. And then, you know, and then uh, part of the thing is really, you know, uh, you want to actually provide virtual matching control. So you have a raw data set, what is, uh, you know, relevant here is a, a algorithm and a, and, and a procedure that for a given that uh, a single arm trial produced for those patients, the virtual match control. So it's not actually providing the raw data, but produce the match data and through, through modeling. And then uh, there's a, there, so there's a one ICP, that's for the uh, virtual, uh, for the natural history study. There also need a, mat, a master protocol to talk about details, master actually, a master SAP to specify a, a comparative effective analysis, you know, of a single arm trial against natural history study. And, and then a uh, lot of settings is, is actually just practical to do an umbrella trial using a master protocol. Now, uh, let's actually get into actually the details of the virtual match control methodology. And then uh, I start with uh, this cartoon, talk about challenges, you know, so it, it, it actually says, you know, uh, rare disease, well, a uh, lack of treatment. You know, uh, we have about 7,000 rare diseases and uh, only 400 or 500 of rare diseases have, have some kind of medical intervention. And the majority of our conditions, more than 6,000 rare diseases don't even have a, a treatment. So that's actually the reason, you know, there's a lot of companies and, and uh, organizations actually doing uh, research on funding uh, and a treatment, uh, um, maybe not a cure. 
And then the problem is actually is that there's also lack of knowledge. There is, you know, because it's so rare, there's not many people actually doing research, so lack of research to really understand everything, every aspect of that. And as a result, if you want to actually do a natural history study, you cannot even find an investigator, I mean, many investigators who have a lot of good research level data that can be used, you know, to construct a, uh, a natural history study. And then one of the things is that, well, here at the bottom, it's a lone whale rare, you know, if you just talk about one rare disease, you know, it's, it's uh, by US definition, it's less than 200,000 prevalence, but in, uh, but then together uh, we are strong, meaning that one in 10 Americans has a rare disease. That, that means, uh, let's say, you know, 300, 300, 300 million, that's the US population, it's, it's, it's outdated. I mean, so rare disease population uh, you know, is probably uh, 30 million. So it's, it's actually pretty, pretty substantial population. And then, uh, so let's actually look at uh, some, go beyond the cartoons. And then some of the data features, is, you know, it's is a small sample size. It's, it's not just actually for, for the clinical trial, but also for natural history, you know, studies, small samples is a problem. And then we have a sparse data collected in real world clinical practice. I mean, different clinicians do things differently. There's no uniform standard. I mean, data is really sparse. I mean, they do a, 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 a you know, slow progressive, uh, Real disease, they, 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 they make measurement every, they go to, patient go to clinic once a year. So it's not like in doing clinical trials, you actually collect data at the baseline, you know, one week later, you know, three months later, six months later, you know, up to a year. So it's very different. And then, you know, usually, you know, patient risk factors, you know, patients are very heterogeneous. I mean, it's a rare disease, but then, you know, uh, and then there's lots of factors affecting uh, the, the disease progression. And uh, the other problem is actually, you know, data quality. And the, the data quality is this is actually pretty much a categorization based on eight FDA uh, limitations on retrospective studies. So I won't actually repeat it here anymore. And uh, the other thing is actually, you look at actually problem of a statistical, existing statistical method that we know that we use all the time actually for common drug. Uh, drug. And, and then and also uh, a specific methodology is used in epidemiological study, which consists of net control analysis, propensity score method, and regression analysis. All these have a, have, have a different set of issues and a, a make this application not applicable. But BI, let's actually, uh, I mean, uh, get into a real, uh, real example. So this is a curve from a certain next example. The background, so with, you know, this is actually a drug for RRMM, relapse refractory multiple myeloma. And uh, the program consists of a single arm trial and a natural history study. Uh, in February 2019, FDODAC concluded that the evidence generated from analysis of RWD is not adequate to provide context or comparison of overall survival observed in the in the single arm study, uh, I mean, it's a storm patient. Now, here's actually what happened. So uh, this company is called the KTI, did original analysis. So you got 64 patients from the natural history that's just 64, imagine that. You know, it's very difficult to get the data. So you got only 64 patients. And then in, in, the, in, in their study, there's 120 patients. So they, they did this analysis, you, you get the, p-value 0.001, and the uh, confidence upper front for hazard ratio is 0.65. Uh, and by the way, you know, I don't know really why the company and the FDA do 95% confidence interval for, for, for each arm. A, a, usually, if you want to compare A and B, in a survival, uh, in continuous distribution, you use 84% confidence interval, not 95. You want 84% confidence upper bound for the control, less than the 84 confidence upper bound of the treatment. That's equivalent to, to do the 95% for, for the difference. So, so this is actually just amazing, you know, why people do this. And then, and then after you said, well, this, your analysis is, not pro is a problematic. You, you're not actually adjusting for the index state. So after adjustment made, you know, you look at the sample size drop from, from 64 to, to, uh, to 37. And then, you know, a p-value is still uh, significant. I, I, I suppose this is a two-sided p-value. 
and then and then the the confidence the upper bound. Uh, the well, I think that this is probably one sided p value. The, the confidence in upper bound is 0.91. However, you know, FDA applied a selection criteria after actually they, they match data based on index state, they applied, you know, a selection criteria based on other risk factors. And, and then you see you, the end dropped to 13 for the natural history study. And then look at the p value 0.33, and the upper bound, you know, increased from point. 6.5 to 1.57. I mean, this is just, you know, an, an, a perfect illustration. If you apply traditional methodology, you know, which is selection based on selection criteria as specified uh, as actually uh, laid out by the SHE-10. You know, remember I said there's two methodologies. One is actually using selection criteria, and then the other is to use uh, adjustment to account for population differences. If you actually do this way, you, this is what you end up with. You're pretty much, you know, I don't know uh, how much uh, this uh, company spent on their natural history study. As far as uh, I know, based on my experience, the year is, is, is two to three million dollars. So this is pretty much everything wasted. And now, the, the issues with, uh, with this sort of analysis, when you have a really, 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 really you know, a uh, small sample size, uh, you know, especially what the FDA did, you know, the exchangeability assumption cannot be justified and the permutation or log rank type analysis is of questionable validity. And you see the impact is massive loss of statistical power. That's why, you know, when you reduce the sample size from 64 to 13, what do you expect? We all know that, right? We always do sample size calculation to make sure we have enough sample size irrespective of the bias. To, to make sure we have a, you know adequate statistical power, and then and then uh, so this is the FDA's analysis. Let me go up. Actually, you know, so uh, the company actually did updated analysis with the match index data, but, but failed to adjust other risk factors. I mean, why did they actually do that? But in the original analysis, you know, nothing is uh, is considered. I I don't know the details. I mean, this is all based on all that uh, uh, FDA's. Uh, Briefing thing for all that. I mean, I would assume just a, just a typical analysis, log rank compare, you know, single arm trial against natural history. I think that's all they did. And then, uh, so you you actually see market reaction pretty sharply. So this is actually you know when when all that occurred, and and then you know the stock dropped. But then, but then where did this? I can get estimate of the impact on the patient. You know, I mean, if, if, if there is a, a, a good drug that can benefit the patient, and then if, you know, and one would really want to, want to understand what is actually the impact of a faulty statistical analysis on the impact of the patient, there's just no way to get this sort of information. So uh, now, actually, back to uh, uh, this uh, virtual one to M matching. and. Uh, uh, that uh, I developed uh, during my previous uh, employment at the Amicus Therapeutics. The general procedure is, is, is as follows. It impute sparse longitudinal data. Remember I said, you know, it could be separate by one year. You have to really make an imputation. Uh, and then w once you've done that, the first thing is to perform exact one to M matching by index date. And then, then once you actually uh, this is the second step. The third step, you know, is to use, uh, uh, to adjust index state match data using model to account for population differences. So the, so the difference between what I'm doing and what FDA is, uh, FDA is doing is, is actually the third step. And the FDA said, well, you know, once you get the index match the data and then you just actually apply another selection criteria to reduce the sample size, Further to, to 13. I, I'm saying, you know, it's pretty, it's a rare disease. I know it's very hard to get the data. Let's actually, you know, use all the data possible and use a valid statistical analysis, which we all know, which is, you know, multiple regression analysis we learn in statistical 101 to borrow information from diverse group of patients and then to predict for a particular patient in the, uh, in the single arm trial what would happen if the patient did not receive the treatment. Note, that uh, 
this sort of procedure, you know, this uh, concept of one to n matching is, uh, is actually developed by the FDA for brain marrow uh, of biomarine for C uh, CRN2 adapting disease. Now, FDA was only able to, FDA actually did not actually use the subsetting methodology, I mean, for that particular case, but then as far as the match control, match data is concerned, they only actually used for summary statistic and, uh, and the graphical presentation. Uh, what I did here is actually really figure out how to analyze the data. So the statistical inference consists of uh, uh, efficient intergroup analysis is start with the exact conditional intra patient test of treatment effect. I mean, this is sort of like one sample test to look at actually how patients are doing relative to a baseline or, or their own natural history study. And then followed by a tipping point analysis. Tipping point analysis is just actually to see how robust the test is by moving the distribution of control to the right, meaning by making it better and better, better until actually the exact uh, conditional interpretation test lose statistical significance. And that, so it's not like uh, creating a, you know, confidence lower bound, if it's a continuous data, but here we're talking about, you know, data doesn't really follow a particular uh, pattern of, of the parametric distribution. And then we can actually use a analysis of what you match, a bootstrap analysis of what you match control analysis to see actually if the upper and the lower bound uh, overlap. And then once you actually get a tipping point analysis, you can actually say, you know, to say, use an expert to say, well, you know, in the current practice, whether, you know, the treatment effect is actually can be better than the tipping point analysis, you know, at the tipping point, for example, the response rate could be 70%, but then whether, you know, in the current practice, you can actually get to 70% if everybody says, oh, 30 or 40, and then pretty, pretty much the result is pretty, uh, pretty, um, pretty uh, robust. And then there's another methodology is actually using concurrent control from, you know, randomized control trial of a hybrid design. And sometimes uh, a company program also have a randomized trial. And the FDA said, well, you don't have to actually power the randomized trial by itself. You can use, the, you know, your, your natural history study as part of the basing analysis. And, and then uh, for the methodology I work on, on the continuous end, uh, workout methodology for continuous endpoint, the categorical endpoint, and the time to event endpoint. And now, let me actually get to the ECO blinding and the SAP development. And, uh, <clears throat> and the setting is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, yearly, you know, the, the trial, single arm trial is on blinding. And then, uh, and then there is a legal and regulatory requirement of perspective analysis or SAP of the micro history study. And then the problem is that the, how do you actually do uh, perspective analysis of uh, perspective, uh, specify analysis perspective and put in the SAP. Usually we do randomized trial, you know, we, we don't even bother to do that. You know, we read a protocol and then we've developed SAP, you know, only actually one, two months before database log, we say, okay, this is finalized SAP. So that's actually the typical process. And then we know actually, you know, from, from design or trial, the data will be pretty much complete. I mean, if you have a 10 or 20 or 20% 20 of a dropout missing data, we only have to deal with that. Most, mostly we actually know what the data we're getting, but then the problem for network is that we really don't. So given the sitting, how do you actually uh, pre-specify an SAP? And the solution is really put a file to separate those with knowledge of single arm trial and natural history study. So this is very simple. So those who know the data natural history study prepare the SAP and don't talk to those people with, uh, with knowledge of single arm trials. And this is actually easily implemented in the umbrella uh, trial setting on the master protocol by a third party, for example, a particular organization for a particular rare disease. Now, now, the process for actually developing this uh, uh, SAP uh, of natural history study is called something adaptive statistical analysis planning methodology. First, you start with a, a metadata report. It, it's actually a, a specific analysis that describes what kind of data you have. And then you can define a analysis population and, and then and, and all those details. It's just really actually a, an effort to understand what data you have. And then uh, the natural history study uh, is that it provides detail of virtual matching procedures and the specific to the single arm trial 
uh, uh, patient prognosis factors because you know the, the object of this uh, natural history ethic is not to actually you know say how I'm going to summarize the data, but rather for each different uh, patient from a single arm trial, you know how am I going to provide a virtual matching? So that's the objective. And then, so you have to actually build in some blended report to determine final regression analysis because there's lots of risk factors. You have to use regression analysis to make adjustment. But then, whether the, the, the prediction is good or not depends on whether the model is good or not. So you really have to actually understand the, the regression analysis to make this adjustment. And then, you know, it has to be prepared by group not involved in the development comparative analysis SAP and, and then report the overall summary statistic after completion of the uh, master SAP. So that means uh, there, there are two SAPs, but then you know, once this SAP is actually uh, produced, and, and then you can provide some summary statistics of the virtual match control, not actually on the individual, le individual level. And then you have to have a master SAP, which is really, you know, after finalized natural history uh, study SAP, you know, this, this would actually prepare uh, to provide the details of statistical inference for comparative effective analysis. And then it has to be prepared by staff blinded to natural history study. Now, uh, I have uh, 20 minutes left. But let me actually go through some applications. And uh, the first one is a uh, breakthrough therapy de de designation of a biologic for the treatment of late onset pompeii disease. And then uh, this is actually uh, a first ever investigative product for uh, <coughs> a Pompeii a disease that received uh, FDA uh, uh, breakthrough therapy designation. And then through, the, through this uh, you know, uh, study, we actually developed virtual match control methodology uh, to compare a single arm trial with the uh, first action, not actually the, 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 the actual uh, retrospective study, but actually, you know, digitized data from, from the literature. And then currently the methodology is planned to compare results of a single arm trial to the actual uh, retrospective, uh, uh, retrospective natural history study. And then the second application is the gene therapy program is a single arm trial retrospective natural history study. This is a, a Endpoint is ordinal categorical variable, and then it's uh, in the process of developing the virtual uh, one to many match control methodology and also developing the efficient inter group analysis. And the third one is actually a rare cancer, and uh, you got the single arm uh, cohort study, a single arm cohort from a, a, a basket trial of a new drug, and then there's also a retrospective natural history study that's already completed. And then the end point is overall survival. And then, you know, uh, again, the routine is pretty much the same. First has to develop uh, virtual one to many match control methodology for time to event end point. And then follow that to develop efficient intergroup analysis. And then, uh, you know, the last application is actually a, a, a setting that uh, one would expect the, you know, the single arm trial uh, you know, and the natural history study by itself would not be sufficient. Uh, and then one would want to still use this information as part of a basin analysis in, uh, with, an, uh, with a subsequent randomized control trial. Again, you know, uh, virtual match control analysis of the single arm trial versus natural history study can be used to provide prior information. So, so it's a prior distribution. And then, you know, and then, you know, the uh, the the uh, uh, randomized control trial provides a posterior uh, provide additional data which can be combined with the prior to to form a posterior distribution and which can be actually used as a basic analysis and the, the the analysis you know the design I developed is that actually you know I can actually make sure that there's a basic analysis control type of error rate I mean usually People talk about basic analysis and ask you, so, well, you know, you have to actually do simulation studies to demonstrate that uh, type of error is controlled. But, but the problem there is that you have to pre-specify uh, the procedure. But when you pre-specify the procedure, if, you know, in, in an adaptive setting, if, uh, if problem A is, is what you're concerned at the design, but then it didn't really happen, but rather there's something that's not not uh, expected problem B popped up. And then what are you going to do? You know, if you use actually 
a typical basin design, and then you are stuck. You have to follow the rules. You follow the adaptation rules. So if you don't, you actually inflate Python error rate. But no, I actually did not use the, the methodology. I use actually more sort of a traditional adaptive design theory based on conditional error functions. And they use that, you can actually have unlimited possibilities of adaptation based on what actually happened, not actually what you think uh, would happen at the, at, the, at the design stage. And then, you know, if you actually read my papers, just a paper 2002 with uh, Mike Pershing of NIH and Gordon Pleasure, and then, you know, actually, you know, there's a very strong theory that shows how that controls the type of error rate. And then, you know, once I have a two-stage adaptive design based on frequency approach using conditional error functions, I simply easily convert it to a basing analysis. That's actually how I did it. In central bypass the traditional, the, the usual method of developing uh, basing analysis. And uh, I have, uh, this is uh, 1246, and then let me actually finish the uh, discussion and, uh, and then probably leave uh, 10 minutes for, for discussion and questions. So, um, to do all this stuff, well, <laughs> you need a clinical trial technology platform. And then uh, under the platform, you have to really work out a methodological framework, which I'm actually working on based on particular applications of continuous data, uh, ordinal categorical variable, and the time to event endpoint. And then, uh, and, and then, Lots of analysis actually really, really time consuming because I have to do exact inference. And so this exact conditional interpatient test is the exact test. And then uh, also I have to bootstrap. So, so this is really, uh, you know, computationally intensive. So what, what is actually necessary is to develop uh, Amazon AWS EC2 for SAAS. R analytics and then and PASS for web, uh, web applications. I mean, SAAS meaning uh, software as a service and PASS is actually a platform as a service. And then you have to actually develop analytics you know, to fit into the cloud system. I also have to you know, do traditional SaaS programs for TLC. And then there is also a need uh, to develop, you know, actually we develop an adaptive statistical analysis the planning process where you can actually develop natural history, SAP, and comparative SAP. And, and then also actually, I mean, in the process of through a, a real project to, to, talk, uh, to think about the concept of umbrella trial under a master uh, control protocol. And also what is actually important is that, uh, I mean, you actually just learn from the, from the Terraform example. I mean, I, I would think, you know, they have a, I don't know any of them, so uh, maybe some of them you do. But I would think you know the the, the statistical stuff is pretty 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 competent in terms of doing the traditional traditional things. But as far as actually doing rare disease, I I honestly don't think actually they know actually what they're doing. And uh, so we need to actually spe a specialty biometrics uh, service provider who are well trained on the methodology te uh, technology platform and the process. And then they have to be highly motivated, efficient, and productive. Uh, and then you know they can actually uh, they can deliver. The delivery is critical uh, in the business. You know, not for the sake of uh, meeting timeline for the sake of meeting timelines, because each day you know there is a there is a there, there is a need for a particular patients who who are suffering. We really have to think about from the perspective of uh, individual patients. And I remember when I was at FDA, I was actually looking at. Uh, my trophy, you know, as, as, that was actually 20 years ago. You know, it's a rare disease, uh, ALS. My trophy is, is a drug by Cephalon for developed for ALS. And, and then the drug was not, the, the, uh, the analysis is not positive. But then you have a patient who are, you know, uh, outside uh, the FDA uh, office protesting. You have people in the wheelchairs. And, and it's just a really, really uh, difficult situation. And, and then, you know, once once you actually get to know the patient, know the families, you know actually, you know, we're not dealing, you know, you know the n equal ten or twenty. You know, we're not dealing with statistical analysis. We're dealing with individual patients, individual lives. And then, uh, so there's a, 
need to, in, in my mind, unless you have a you know big pharma, you have a pretty pretty nice setup about statistic group with all the training, and then uh, and then the best way is to have a you know external resource to have a statistical clinical expert to develop to help develop a clinical program, put together efficient trial design and a methodological sound statistical analysis, and then do have the ability to do statistical modeling, trial simulation, and then provide blinded SAPs. And then, you know, so this external resource, you have to have an expert. You also have a well-trained uh, specialty biometric service provider who does that sort, sort of this uh, routine, routine work. And, and then they have to rely on clinical trial uh, technological platform. And then, and then I have to really work with FDA review team and, and the management to use all the resources you have, which, which include legal resources as well as patient advocacy. Sometimes, you know, you just have to go there to, 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 teach, uh, to educate the FDA, you know, about the disease and about, you know, our medical need because, you know, um, you know uh, FDA have a lot of good professionals, but then they do not necessarily know about particular areas. There's 6,000 of them. You know, there's a lot, and probably they, they, they never heard of the, a rare disease, and then all of a sudden you have to actually submit a protocol. You really have to actually communicate with the FDA review team, and, and sometimes if it doesn't really work well, maybe I should talk to uh, General Wilcock at the management level. And, uh, well, usually it's not that bad, and the FDA, for, for the sake of uh, uh, implementing the law, FDA actually put together an innovative design pilot, so you can actually use this uh, 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 methodology, uh, you know, th this approach to, to, uh, to, to showcase your design, to see, you know, what it is, you know, particular type of design is necessary and what is the purpose and, and then, and after you give you extra review time and uh, there will be a public meeting to really uh, discuss it, discuss uh, everything. I mean, probably you've got experts from NIH and, and other uh, ac uh, academic institutions. And, uh, well, uh, that's it. Uh, this is the last page of the slide. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. So we might be able to open the floor right now. Um, see anyone have any questions. If you are muted, you might want to unmute yourself or you can type your question to the group chat. Meanwhile, I actually personally have a question. I really enjoyed your presentation today and it's very informative and especially you have a hands-on experience on all those rare disease related to trial design, including natural history study. So my personal question is, um, was, your was your collaboration with different uh, industry companies and also working with FDA interaction? What is the current FDA requirements or the practice, industry practice you have seen for developing natural history studies, SAB specifically? Uh, well, uh, it, well, it's, uh, you know, you, you see, uh, for example, uh, yeah, well, let's actually look at the, uh, uh, what is actually the sort of a requirement, and then let's and then talk about the uh, FDA uh, and then industry practice. And those those are two different things. And I I uh, in the presentation I I presented that uh, that's part of SHE ten, right? And also uh, this is even required by the law. <laughs> It's amazing how those lawmakers can figure this out. <laughs> and then it's also part of the framework. But also uh, part of the framework. Here is actually uh, what uh, the, the framework document said. It's in addition to study design and the, and the data consideration, transparency about study design and analysis before execution is critical for ensuring confidence in the result. And then they talk about clinicaltrial.gov. I guess you can <clears throat> you can you can say how you analyze the data. But then uh, <clears throat> but then it says uh, the potential like upfront transparency, especially in uh, in retrospect natural history, retrospect observational study design and conduct, coupled with the fact that retrospective analysis in like in electronic data set can be conducted multiple times relatively inexpensively with varying study design elements and making it possible to conduct numerous retrospective studies 
until the desired result is obtained and then submitted only favorable result as if they were result of a single study with a pre-specified pre protocol. So, I mean, this is essentially, you know, like, like 20 years ago, I mean, FDA realized in, in randomized trial, you, you just cannot analyze data day in, day out. And then that's why it become group sequential design become po popular. But here they are saying the same thing. You have to have things pre-specified and whatever the design is, and then you just kind of, you know, keep, keep on doing this uh, all the time. So, uh, so that's actually FDA sort of uh, uh, FDA sort of a requirement, and uh, and I think uh, in working with uh, with a team with FDA, you know, review team, they also requires that. But then there's a really, I mean, the the, the latest thing is to look at the FDA guidance document for for natural history studies. But the, as far as the industry. Uh, practice is, is, is concerned. I mean, for all the example, most of the cases I, I dealt with have a pre-specified uh, pre SAP, but, but then the problem actually is, is very limited to a summary statistics, you know, how many patients we have and the completeness of data, what is the patient's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, disposition, that sort of, that sort of thing. It, but you know, those are things that are important, but then what is really relevant is that uh, the SAP for generating virtual match controls or, or uh, match controls. So that's actually um, uh, what is lacking in most of the cases I, 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 I encountered. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful because I just want to know some experience based on that from your hands-on experience. Uh, we do have a question from online. Vicky Zhang has a question. Uh, I can read it for you. Do you have any recommendation about the limitation of a small sample size for the matching analysis in the rare disease indication? Well, uh, well, the sample size, I mean, you're not able to calculate, you know, it's sometimes, you know, in randomized trial, you say, well, this is not based on statistical consideration of type 1 and, 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 uh, and the type 2 error rate, right? I mean, but uh, you have to actually really look at the specific application. You have sometimes, as I said, there's a lack of research and there's not a whole lot of investigators who actually does this sort of things in, in the in research uh, uh, level, so you, you pretty much have to, you know, uh, you know, have your clean ops to really figure out how many inv investors have the data and then give an estimate of that, and you get everything you can get. But then, uh, I mean, this is actually there's nothing you can do about it, and uh, you find every investigator, investigators, but some investigators will not actually give you anything. You know, you have to actually ex exclude them from your uh, analysis set. But then the issue is that once you get the data, what do you do with it? I mean, the one thing you should not do is to actually like uh, like, 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 like the care farm. The pretty case, you know, you actually reduce the, the, the scanned limited 64 patient natural history study to 13 patients. Definitely not to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay. So anyone have any additional question? I think we will accept one more question and we'll wrap up for our seminar today. So some people might be muted because uh, we have a lot of people online, so when people talk and someone has a background noise, that's why we mute everyone except the organizer and the speaker. So if you have a last minute question, you can type like what Vicky did. Okay. So if no more questions, I all thank today our speaker, Dr. Uh, Liu, very much for your presentation and uh, sharing your knowledge and hands-on experience about the consulting for natural history studies and rare disease to the community. Um, and we really appreciate your time and thank everyone joining our seminar today. We all have a monthly journal club as we discussed at the beginning. So we'll have another one switch the gear to the big data uh, space. Um, so stay tuned. We'll have our advice, uh, advertisement to everyone. Thank you so much. See you guys next time.
Well, thank you. Thanks for your attention. And please contact me if you have a particular case. Thank you. Bye.